Let's look at some more involved examples. So let's say we have two linked lists and we want one that contains all the elements of both. We can call that extend, which takes two linked lists, s and t. A base case is when s is empty. Then the list that contains all the elements of both s and t, when s doesn't have any elements in it, is just t. Otherwise, what we need to do is build up a list of everything that is in t and in s, except for that first element, and then we'll put that first element on the front. So what I'm going to do is link together the first element of s with the list that you get by extending the rest of s and t. So 4 looked like this. And if I extend 4 with 4, I should get 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4 as a list of length 8. And that worked because uh, extending empty in 4 just gave me 1, 2, 3, 4 back. And extending a really short list, say what I get from just linking 4 and empty together to 4, gave me the first element of that followed by the rest of the list, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. And by repeating this process recursively, I was able to build up one list with all the elements of both, s and t. In addition, we could reverse the elements in s. Now it turns out that this is actually hard to write directly. But the easiest way to reverse the elements in a linked list is to use a helper function, which I'll call reverse to, which takes an s and reverses it into the second argument through recursive calls, starting out with the empty list. OK, so reverse to takes in some s and some t. And what it's going to do is, similar to extend, it's going to give me back one linked list with all the elements of s and all the elements of t, except for the elements of s will be in the reverse order in the conclusion. OK, so if s is empty, then we just return t. Otherwise, well, here's where we have to differ from what we did before. Instead of putting the first on the front, we're going to put it directly onto t. So I'm going to take the first of s. I'm going to link that to t. And that will be the end of my list. I also need to reverse all the other elements in the rest of s onto this new result. And that's my return value in my recursive case. So if I reverse 4, I'll get 4, 3, 2, 1. And how did I get there? Well, I started with empty, and then I put 1 on, and then I put 2 on, and then I put 3 on, and then I put 4 on. Each one of those additions was made by evaluating this expression, which took the first thing in whatever s I was currently processing, and adding that to whatever I had built up so far. You can also have higher order sequence processing functions using linked lists. I could define apply to all link, which takes in some function and some linked list. And what does it do? Well, it applies that function to every element of s. If there are no elements of s, then there are no elements to apply it to. Otherwise, what I need to do is link together the result of applying f to the first element in s, and then recursively applying the function f to everything in the rest of s. And that's the return value in the recursive case. So if I define square to be a function that squares things, I can square a number, or I can apply square to all of the elements of 4, and I'll get 1, 4, 9, 16 from 1, 2, 3, 4. And the result is a linked list. All right, we're getting progressively more complicated. Let's do a big one. Remember this partition function, def partition. 
of n and n is something about the partitions of integer n using parts up to n. Now, what are we going to do? Before we counted these up, this time we're going to actually write them all out. So we're going to return a list of a linked list. Each partition is a linked list of numbers. So we're going to return a list of a list of the different partitions. Now, the tree recursive function I'm going to write has the same structure as the one that I used to count these up. But the base case return values and recursive return values will change so that we can build up lists instead of just returning the counts. So we begin by saying if we reach a case where n is 0, there's a way to partition 0, and that's with the empty list. Now, if I want to return a list of lists that only contains the empty list, I'll write that. So this is a list with one element, and that one element is the empty list, which is the way that you partition 0. Now, on the other hand, if n is less than 0, that's impossible to partition, so there really is no way to do it. And if m is 0, then there's no way to partition any number greater than 0, which n must be because we've passed the first two cases. OK. So now we have to ask in our recursive case, do we use at least one m? If the answer is yes, that means a recursive call to partitions using n minus m as the what we have to partition in addition to what we have so far, and m as our largest thing that I can use to partition. If the answer is no, then I recursively call partitions on n using m minus 1. These recursive calls look just like the case when we were counting these things up. OK, now we do have to worry about what return values we got. Yes and no are all both bound to lists of lists. And the no's are full partitions. The yeses are actually not partitions of n, but partitions of n minus m. So we need to add an m to the front. So let's create a function that adds an m to the front of a list, which takes in a sequence and links m onto the front of that sequence. Then we can get all of the yeses that actually have an m on them by applying this add m function to each element of yes. At which point, we can return the result of extending with m and no. And that gives me a list of all the lists in here and all the lists in there. Let's see how we did. Partitions of 6, comma 4. There's a whole bunch of stuff. It looks promising. We have 4 and 2. We have 4 and 1 and 1. We have 3 and 2 and 1. And it looks like we have a whole bunch of 1s here at the end. Neat, but not that easy to visualize. So maybe we can write a little bit more code in order to make this display in a prettier way. So I'm going to write a function called join, which takes in a linked list s. And the separator, if, f, if s is empty, it just returns an empty string. Otherwise, if uh, the rest of s is empty, meaning there's only one element in this thing, then we're going to return a string representation of that first element. Finally, we know that there are at least two elements at this point, we can return a string that consists of the first element and then the separator and then what we get by joining together the rest of s using that same separator. So what does join do? Well, it gives me back a string. If I were to join 4, 
using a separator such as comma, then I have a string, one, two, three, four. Or if I use plus as my separator, then I'll have the string one plus two plus three plus four. Which is handy because now I can use that in order to print out these partitions. So in order to print the partitions of n with parts up to size m, I first have to get all the different lists by calling partitions. Then I need to convert them all into strings by applying to all of these a function that takes in a sequence and joins it using the string plus. And I'm applying this to all the lists of links. OK, finally, what I'd like to do is print out the result of joining all of these strings using a new line each time. So this says separate partitions by a new line. If we're lucky here, and nothing's gone terribly wrong, then when I type print partitions of six using parts up to size four, I will see nicely displayed all of the different ways to sum up to six. How did we get here? Well, we generated all those partitions as a linked list of linked lists. Then we turned each one of those linked lists into a string, such as four plus two or four plus one plus one, and then we joined all those strings together into one big string separated by new lines.